Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here. Some interesting corollaries between America and Britain have come to my attention. The corollaries are old on the American side and very new on the British side. In fact, you have to go back 150 years on the American facts, while the British parallels are very current and renewed daily. Just before the American Civil War, which started in 1861, America looked a lot like Britain today. It may seem hard to believe at first glance that an agrarian society using slave labor would in any way resemble a postmodern industrial republic, but it is the case. First, there was a group comprising about 10% or so of the population which was undereducated, largely unskilled, and thought themselves superior in habit and culture. In America, it was the slaveholders and their supporters. In Britain, it is the Muslims. Second, there was a group who claimed the divine right to hold slaves. In America, it was Bible-thumping whites owning blacks. In Britain, it is Koran-thumping men owning women. In both cases, they claim God's authority on the matter and arrogate to themselves a position of piety while relegating their opponents to the position of impious infidels. It is interesting to note that both slaveholding groups claimed that they were a paternal influence and a benefit to their slaves. In America, it was said blacks were better off on plantations, while in Britain, it is said today that women would be better off wearing veils and staying home unless escorted by a male relative. Slavery was touted as a humanitarian good, which the slaves were lucky to be subjected to in the American South and in Britain today. Third, there was a group who detested owning humans. In America, it was mostly Christians and mostly in the northern states, though secular opposition was present as well. In Britain, the English Defense League and the British National Party comprise the resistance, such as it is, and they display a likewise religious flavor, using symbols and language from the Crusades, that ancient Christian war against Islam. There were slaves who believed in slavery in the American South, just as there are women in Islam who believe in wearing the veil and do not question their husband's right to beat them. But it must also be owned that there were slaves who yearned for freedom. And likewise, there are Muslim women today who would prefer autonomy and self-guided happiness to authoritarian dictates and physical abuse. Ayan Hirsi Ali is but the most lauded and visible example. In America, the anger and impatience of the civilians led to outbreaks of violence, largest of which was in Kansas in 1856, and it is remembered as bloody Kansas in the history books. In America, the government tried to ignore and suppress the problem. Federal troops were dispatched to Kansas, to put down the lynch mobs that were performing summary executions on slave owners. And so the irony can be seen in hindsight. Government power was used to protect the group that was systematically violating rights. That same government power would be used within five years of bloody Kansas to begin pursuing and destroying those violators. In Britain, Government political correctness and multiculturalism make it uncouth and increasingly illegal to mention the problem with candor. If the problem is mentioned in Britain today, it is described as a problem of xenophobes and racists picking on an innocent religious minority. As in America, the British government has every incentive to ignore the problem and hope it goes away. And as with America, the problem will not go away. We can only hope for 
and work toward an irony where the government which today ignores the plight of freedom-loving Brits will tomorrow regain its dignity and begin again protecting and upholding those rights. In America, the problem of slavery was not solved without the slaughter of several hundred thousand citizens. In Britain, the future remains open on this question, but it is the proverbial five minutes to midnight, and the lights of civilization are being snuffed out all over Europe. Mass slaughter may yet play itself out on the European soil, which has not seen war in more than 60 years. Far be it from me, your humble servant, to blithely offer advice on such a seemingly insurmountable problem. But the difference in the astounding violence engulfing Europe today, and America's, in comparison, seemingly minor problems with Muslim immigrants, suggest a few tactics which Europe would do well to adopt. It is a simple solution, and not a panacea, but it appears to work well. That is, stop giving state support and protection to any religious group. Adopt with due haste the American model of freedom of religion and freedom from religion. No other tactic will prevent this incorrigible group from seeking and seizing power. Religion is a private matter, and as such it must be protected by the state from the state. But as America's founding fathers did well to point out, separating religion and state is not only for the protection of religion, but more urgently for the protection of the integrity, independence, and justice of the state. If religion is to play a role in the coming civil wars in Europe, so be it. But peace and prosperity in the long run are the province of secularism. No religion of any stripe has ever provided or will ever offer to provide that. And now, let Theo van Gogh's words haunt you, as they should. Allah is the scourge which will conquer Amsterdam. Sleep well, good Amsterdamers. Sleep well.